and good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending where you are. Uh, I'm Janice Kaminer Resnick, and on behalf of Jews United for Democracy and Justice and Community Advocates, I want to welcome you to our America at a Crossroads program tonight. My dear colleague, David Lehrer, is on vacation. He'll be back next week, and we wish him, once again, safe travels. Thanks, as always, to our leadership team, including Xavier Oslovsky and former Congressman Mel Levine. And a special welcome and thank you to tonight's guests, Ambassador Michael McFall and Larry Diamond. It's wonderful to welcome both of you back to America Crossroads. We are very appreciative. Next yes. Wednesday, August 16th, we'll return to the explosive topic of America, of the American political scene with acclaimed pundit and analyst, David Gergen. David will be in conversation with Madeline Brand. If there's anyone who can help us better understand and reflect on the current, I'll call it chaos, and highly consequential political situation, it's David Gergen. The following week on August 23rd, we'll hear from one of the most respected abortion law experts in the country, Mary Ziegler. And then on August 30th, we'll hear from the Dean of Berkeley School of Law, Erwin Shemarinsky, who is considered one of the most brilliant constitutional law scholars in the country. Later this week, we'll be posting all of our September lineup which will be every September, every Wednesday in September. So uh, stay tuned for those announcements and registration opportunities. There are some changes at Eventbrite and now you should be able to connect to our program from the Zoom link in your Eventbrite registration. If you succeeded in doing that, let me know, send me an email. We will continue to send the Zoom link as we always have via email. So if you're used to it the way we have it now, nothing will be changing. Uh, but we hope that the change at Eventbrite will make it more efficient for those of you who want to access our program in that way. Now to introduce tonight's guest, it is my pleasure to welcome a colleague and friend, member of our judge executive leadership team and former Los Angeles County Supervisor, Zev Yaroslavsky. Zev? Thank you very much, Janice. And good evening, everyone, or good morning, wherever you may be. Uh, tonight, we're poised to have a, a most timely topic, Ukraine and Russia. And we are privileged to be led in this discussion by two experts who are most qualified to do so. Ambassador Mike McFall is a leading expert on all things Russia. He is the director of the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University and holds other academic posts at, the, at that university. I first met Mike when we were part of, a of the National Democratic Institute's delegation to Moscow and St. Petersburg, conducting seminars on democratization. That was back in 1991. We have stayed in touch ever since. He is one of the most knowledgeable experts on democratic movements in Russia and the Putin regime's effort to suppress them. Mike was named ambassador to Russia in 2011 by President Barack Obama and served until early 2014. He arrived in Moscow as massive demonstrations unfolded in opposition to Vladimir Putin's re-emergence as the Russian president. As ambassador, he often met with pro-democracy activists who saw democratic prospects slipping away. This didn't endear him to Putin, for whom McFall has been a nemesis for years. Uh, Mike is the author of an outstanding book, From Cold War to Hot Peace, a must read for anyone wanting to understand today's Russia. Mike is also a regular commentator on MSNBC, and he has appeared frequently on America at a Crossroads. He will be in conversation tonight with Larry Diamond, an American political sociologist and leading contemporary scholar in the field of democracy studies. Larry is a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, which is Stanford's main center for research on international issues. Larry Diamond has served as an advisor to numerous governmental and international organizations at various points in his life, including the United States Department of State, the United Nations, the World Bank, and the U.S. Agency for International Development. Larry is also a frequent interlocutor on our programs, and it's a privilege to have both Larry and Mike with us tonight. I turn it over to you both. Thank you uh, so much, Zev. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Mel. Uh, most of all, thank you, uh, my good friend and colleague who's sitting about 100 yards away from me in Encino Hall at Stanford University, Mike McFall, uh, for joining us. So Mike, uh, with your permission, I'd like to start with Russia and then come to uh, Russia's war on Ukraine and take stock of that. Um, we've had a, a kind of turbulent and historic uh, last few weeks uh, since June 27th, when the leader of this famous mercenary 
group, the Wagner group, Yevgeny Prigozhin, launched this shocking and audacious, what seemed like an armed mutiny against the government of Russia and maybe against even the man we thought who was his sponsor, Vladimir Putin. Uh, at one point, Prigozhin's forces were just 125 miles away from Moscow. And then the insurrection collapses. He goes into exile in Belarus, we heard. Then he's not in exile. You know, he seems to be back in Russia. You know, what the heck is going on there? Uh, does Is Prigozhin back in Putin's good graces? Does the Wagner group still function? What is the state of Vladimir Putin's command of power in Russia? Well, we're starting with an easy question, huh, Larry? Um... <laughs> First, uh, Janice Mel, uh, Zev, thanks again for having me back. Uh, these numbers that you have, participants, are truly outstanding. Uh, Zev, you break my heart by wearing that UCLA uh, T-shirt. You left us. We're now down to the Pac-4 here. Truly tragic times here for us that, that, that love Stanford football. I know Larry does too, just so everybody knows. Um, and Zev, I, I meant I rushed down from my office at home uh, I was going to have your book on this big uh, brown space uh, product placement, but I'll make sure to tweet it out right after we're done. Congratulations on joining Larry and I as, as book authors as well. Um, Larry, to your question, you know, I could, I could burn up 50 minutes answering it because it's a really complicated story. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the 30,000 feet. And then if you want to dive deeper, uh, a deeper dive or people doing questions, we'll go there, right? But the first thing I want to say about Mr. Prigozhin uh, and the Wagner Group um, is he has a long history of working with Mr. Putin. Uh, he's called Putin's chef because he, he made a lot of money catering for uh, events at the Kremlin. He's, he's a multimillionaire, maybe a billionaire, because of his personal relationship with Putin. That's the first thing I want to say. Secondly, there's some confusion. He has these armed forces, these paramilitary groups. Um, that have been all over the world, in Africa, Syria, uh, and most recently in Ukraine. Uh, but I think it's important for people to understand they're not independent. Uh, they're fully funded, supported by the Russian government and by Vladimir Putin. Um, and because I've been on this group uh, talking about other things, I want to also remind people that Mr. Prigozhin uh, also got involved in our own politics. Uh, back in 2016, if you remember when the Russians were uh, publicizing uh, disinformation on our social media platforms, that was also an operation of the same guy, Mr. Prigozhin. Um, uh, over time, he's become, I watch him on, uh, and I see him and I you know, watch him on t Telegram and listen to him so you all don't have to. Uh, but over time, I would say he's gotten arrogant. Uh, he's gotten critical of the Russian armed forces, uh, saying that they're incompetent compared to his group, the Wagner group. Eventually, they were invited into the fight uh, and they took some heavy losses in the fight in Ukraine, um, uh, particularly around the city Bakhmut, uh, where they sustained heavy losses. Um, and at a certain point in time, and this is all mysterious, right? These are, I, Larry, I want to be clear. Like, these are my guesstimates or what's happening because nobody knows what's happening. Uh, Bill Burns, my good friend who runs, ahead of, who runs the CIA, they're guessing as well. It, this, these are hard targets, as the intelligence community says, because Putin's very careful about uh, you know, he's not on Zoom calls, Larry. Uh, he doesn't use cell phones. Uh, um, but to the best of my knowledge, as I watched this story pretty closely, there became a certain point where the traditional armed forces got tired of Mr. Prigozhin and all of his criticism and all of his attacks. And they basically convinced Putin to shut him down. And on July 1st, that was the, the due date for them to, to, they'd already been pulled from the front line. They were hanging out in camps in Ukraine. And that was the day they were supposed to dissolve and take jobs into the traditional armed forces. And Prigozhin didn't want to do that. I think he rightly calculated that his days might be numbered if that happened. And most certainly his independent power base would be numbered. And, and you know, from reporters that I follow that, that know this story well, um, uh, Russian reporters, 
he kind of went crazy there. He kind of, you know, decided the only way I can survive is to do something dramatic. And that's when he announced we're marching to Moscow. And remember, he wasn't marching to Moscow to overthrow Putin. He was very, very precise. And I listened to those those telegram, uh, telegram those communications. He was, you know, broadcasting all this in real time. He said he was going to save justice, or you know, all that kind of language about you know uh, freedom and justice. But his his co complaints were about the Minister of Defense, Mr. Shoigu, and the Chairman of their Joint Chiefs, the equivalent uh, General Garasimov, and he got to Rostov, and nobody stopped him. Uh, Rostov is the main town from where the, the fighting, the headquarters are for the fighting in Ukraine, right? Uh, and he was there giving interviews. Nothing happened to him. He didn't lose any forces. That was very striking to me, Larry. Like, how could he do that? Where are the border guards? Where are the KGB guys? Where, where are all these armed forces? And he got there without a fight. And then, as you just pointed out, he was on his way to Moscow got to the outskirts of town, um, uh, experienced some fighting, right, some resistance, and, and they killed some um, armed forces of, of the Russian Federation. Um, and that's when Putin got on national television. It was a very dramatic speech. He said, I'm in charge. We're going to stop these traitors, uh, this mutiny. I, I'm, not, I'm just paraphrasing the words now, so please don't quote me directly, but something along those lines. Um, and I'm watching this in real time, you know, because I have to toggle back and forth to MSNBC where I work. And I was saying, you know, I, I remember, you know, very vividly saying, we're going to see a showdown here. Uh, and then when push came to shove, Putin did not escalate. He didn't call in the Air Force to, to bomb these forces. Uh, he pulled back. And he cut a deal with Prigozhin along the lines that you said, Larry, that, that he would go into exile with his forces to Belarus. Uh, Mr. Lukashenko, the head of Belarus, allegedly was the negotiator here, the mediator. But, you know, this was all being done through the Kremlin. Um, and it seemed like he had dodged a bullet and he was going to, you know, de-arm de these guys. And, and that there has been a lot of demilitarization. They've handed over a lot of their heavy equipment. But now, uh, Mr. Putin just held a, a major summit with many African leaders, and there were photos of Prigozhin in his jeans and shirt, by the way. It looked like he was his private house. He's from St. Petersburg, as Mr. Putin is, having his own private one-on-one -on -one sessions with many African leaders. Um, and, you know, what does it all mean? I mean, I think it, I think some things are evident that that Putin is not in control uh, as he would like to be. Uh, anytime you call somebody a traitor and then do a deal with them four hours later, that's a sign of weakness, not a sign of strength. Uh, but and and also it means the Prigozhin and the Wagner people are now out of Ukraine. That's a good thing as far as I'm concerned because they are very well-trained fighters and, and good that they're not killing Ukrainians, good that they're out of there. I think that's a good development. But the long term, I think, you know, listening and watching uh, different Russian channels and talking to people in Russia and people in exile, it, 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 it is feeling like Putin is not in control, that this doesn't happen if everybody's uh, rallying to the cause of a leader, this happens when people are beginning to feel like things are pulling apart. And I'm not predicting the collapse of Russia. I completely do not uh, associate with that camp. Uh, I do just think it's a sign that that there is not unity behind this war. And the last thing I'll say, I'm sorry I went on for so long, but remember, none of this would have happened had Putin not invaded Ukraine. I think that's really important for people to remember that this is a consequence of his decision to invade Ukraine, uh, many, many, one of many negative consequences, obviously for Ukraine, but also for Russia. But it's a symptom uh, of the fact that things are not going according to plan inside Ukraine. Okay, I want to ask you two more what does it mean questions. First of all, what does it mean for Russia's ability to uh, wage, continue to wage this war on Ukraine 
and fight it uh, with maximum, you know, effectiveness, uh, mobilizational capacity, uh, and so on. Um, is Russia's war fighting ability now weakened by taking the Wagner Group out, Wagner Group out of this battle? Yes. Uh, yes, uh, with some caveats. So yes, they were the fighting forces uh, that were going on the offensive to try to take this, this tiny little town of Bakhmut. I'm sure many of our listeners were reading about that. It went on for months and months. Uh, tremendous casualties on both sides. They were the ones leading that offensive uh, operation. Um, but there's some caveats. Uh, to do so, uh, they drafted or, in, you know, signed up. I, I don't know what the right word would be. Uh, many recruits uh, from Russian prisons who were not the best in, uh, fighters of the Wagner group. And those, those, those people were just cannon fodder. They just threw them literally to die. Uh, it reminds me of the Battle of Stalingrad, uh, which I visited as ambassador. I was there for the 70th anniversary and learning about just the horrific carnage in that battle, that's what happened to them. So, so yes, the, their their scary fighting forces are gone. But remember, the the main thrust of the fighting at the time was not their best fighting forces. They were on the back, uh, uh, the, on the sidelines. But an, an important thing to remember about the the consequences in terms of the fighters who are still there, the Russians, is that these Wagner fighters were respected by the soldiers, not by the generals. You know, Gerasimov couldn't stand this guy. I mean, I, I'm presuming he still can't stand him, right? I mean, why would you wanna, you know, uh, it's a sign of weakness that you, ha you had these private military come in uh, to do things that your army was not doing. But the soldiers on the ground if, from reporting shows that they did respect these Wagner folks. And I think it's demoralizing to those soldiers that were left behind that they've lost these, these you know, these fierce fighters. And again, you know, probably uh, lionized more than they deserve. But and I think that's also a good sign, right? Uh, I think that if we're demoralized, if there's something going on that is demoralizing Russian soldiers in the trenches, I think that's a good sign as well. But the third thing I would all, I would say as well is. Right now, the Russian forces are in a defensive posture. Uh, and we're probably going to talk about counteroffensives yeah. and things like that in a moment. But on the defensive side, that's not the strong suit of these Wagner fighters, right? They're, and so in a, in a way, they've done what they were asked to do in Bakhmut. And now those that are there dug in their trenches with all their minds in front of them, uh, that's a different kind of fighter uh, that the Wagner folks are not particularly adept at doing. Okay, uh, we'll come to the war on and in Ukraine in just a minute, but one more what does it mean question. I'll see if I can get you to repeat what you said on MSNBC uh, uh, after uh, it looked like Putin had uh, accepted Prigozhin back into the decent, if not good graces of Putin's uh, circle of power. Um, what does it say about Putin's, about how afraid we should be of Putin's will and resolve to escalate that in the face of this, he seems to have this pretty serious challenge, if not to him, at least to the order around him. Uh, Putin seems to have, to some extent, backed down. What, is, yeah. what should this tell the Biden administration about how fearful we should be of Putin's resolve to escalate? Yeah, it's a hard question, but an important one. Um, and I wanna preface my remarks by, I, I don't wanna generalize from one event to know exactly what, how Putin will uh, behave in another situation. But you know, as you know, Larry, I've been involved in debates with the administration from the very beginning, um, uh, you know, toggling back and forth between uh, you know, d conversations about what should be done and then public debates. And, um, you know, one of the central um, fears that President Biden himself has, and it, it is the president, it is not Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor or somebody else. It is the president of the United States. Um, and it's a fear that I want him to have. I want to be clear about that. 
Uh, he does not want the United States of America to be dragged into a direct conflict with Russia. And he sometimes even calls it, this, these are his words, not mine, World War III uh, because of the war in Ukraine. Um, so he wants to do just enough to help them win, but not too much to get us into a war. Uh, and in the back of their minds, as I talk to them, uh, they're worried about escalation, as you, you, know, you alluded to. They're worried about if we provide this weapon or we do this thing, Putin will escalate. And the, the, the one escalatory uh, uh, lever that he can pull, he doesn't really have many others, by the way. In fact, I don't think he has any, uh, would be the use of a nuclear weapon in Ukraine. And, and they're rightfully fearful of that. Where I think they're wrong, in my analysis, is they think that it, but if Putin's backed into a corner, if he's forced to escalate, if he has no off ramps, then that's when he will use a nuclear weapon, right? That's when he'll do something that dramatic. And that's just a hypothesis about Putin. That's not a fact. We don't know that. He wants us to think that. And he wants us to think that, in my view, for some very practical, instrumental reasons, because he wants to deter us from providing uh, weapons that might make the Ukrainian forces more effective. In particular, he wants to deter us from providing long range missiles, they're called attackums, and he wants to deter us from providing F-16s. And so by threatening to be escalatory, it's, a, it's not just irrational, it's very rational in my view. And to have his surrogates do it, this guy Dmitry Medvedev is his main guy that's always out there, his attack dog, always doing it. I think what we learned from this moment was that Putin had his back up against the wall. Uh, he was promising uh, the Russian people that he was going to escalate. Um, and I want to, I want to, I want to make sure everybody understands. This was like an Oval Office address from the President of the United States late at night to the entire country, covered on all channels, saying we are going to crush these people. And then yet he didn't. He backed down, he cut a deal, uh, you know, he didn't escalate it. He de-escalated because he uh, decided that of the two options, uh, the getting off, the, you know, backing down was his better option of uh, a bad option and a really bad option. And so again, I, I don't want to, I don't want to speculate that they'll do that again, but the proposition that is just sometimes axiomatically stated when I talk to people in the administration and on TV and on Twitter, oh, well, Putin, he's such a tough guy, you know, he'll, he'll, only, uh, he'll only negotiate when he has off ramps. Uh, I think there's an alternative hypothesis, an alternative explanation that it might be that when he's losing is when he might negotiate. Um, and by the way, uh, there's other historical leaders and other historical exam examples where, where leaders negotiate when they're losing, not when they're winning or when they have a stalemate on the battlefield. Good, well, I was gonna ask you later, you're the one that raised it, so I might as well ask you right now, um, should we be providing, uh, put you right on the spot here, um, the attackums and the F-16s that they've been asking for, a long, for, for such a long time, should we be pushing the envelope more on advanced weapons delivery? Yes, I think we should. And for a number of reasons. Um, number one, I don't, I don't see Putin in a situation of stalemate negotiating. That's another assumption that, that you know. And is it fair to say stalemate is what we have now? Well, with some caveats, the Ukrainians are making some um, um, uh, uh, advancements, but not, you know, not nearly as fast as they want. But but he thinks he can be there for a long, long time. Uh, he thinks time is on his side. He, of course, is waiting for our election because he, he, he you know, reasonably, in my view, uh, given what we know about Mr. Trump's views of the war, thinks that if Mr. Trump is reelected, 
that that will uh, be more uh, create better conditions for him to negotiate, um, and and therefore um, stalemate for him is uh, he, he he thinks he can fight for a long time. Um, we, uh, in my view, if we want to try to uh, speed up the end of this war, we want to do what we can to end stalemate. Uh, and in my view, providing attackums, providing F-16s, providing more demining uh, equipment, you know, we could go through the list, but the more and effective weapons uh, that we provide, I think is a, a, a strategy to speed the end of the war rather than to prolong it. Um, so, you know, that's, that's my argument. I understand the, the argument on the other side that they don't need these weapons, that it'll be escalatory but I just think it's the wrong argument. And I wanna be crystal clear about this uh, because you know we're talking very analytically, very abstractly. What does prolonging the war mean? What does stalemate mean? That means that every single day, more Ukrainians are gonna die. That also means, by the way, the more Russians are gonna die. So it's not just uh, peace, it, it's destruction, it's death. And, and I want fewer people to die. Uh, and, and in my view, providing those weapons in the long run uh, will, will mean fewer people will, will die than, than this kind of incrementalism where this war could go on for years and years and years. And that just means more and more Ukrainians will die. And actually, in fact, more and more R Russians will die as well. And you want food supplies to flow to Africa and, uh, you know, uh, the the whole of Europe not not to be living on under a cloud of potential war escalation, great and points. Stockpiles of of weapons and ammunition uh, in Europe and the United States not to be stressed by the constant need for uh, aid to Ukraine. I mean, it all makes compelling sense. I'm probably not supposed to say this as moderator, but I strongly agree with you. Um, so Larry, you can say whatever you want at any time, because you know a lot about these so, issues. Well, that, please, I'll start to interview a, you when we get to the half hour. No, uh, no, that's not going to happen. But um, let's go on to assess the current state of the conflict and the notion of um, some degree of stalemate, but maybe some degree uh, of hope. Ukraine has launched a counteroffensive. I'll say that you told me in our discussion beforehand, maybe we shouldn't think of it in the singular, but in the plural. Um, so how do you assess the current state of the war and of Ukraine's effort to break the elements of stalemate that now exist and actually claim back territory? Well, before I answer that, I want to give it, I want to give a little more context because um, I think we make a, an analytic mistake if we just focus on what's happening right now, right? So it's like, you know, Larry, you and I go to Stanford basketball games. It's like, you know, analyzing the third quarter where, you know, it's back and forth and the third quarter, you know, one team's up by one point or two points. That looks like a stalemate, but you got to remember what happened in the first and second quarters. And if you bring that context in, I think it's very important for people to understand that so far, and, and we're not to the end of the game, right, to stretch the analogy, but so far in the way that I look at it, Ukraine is winning this war. They may have lost some battles and they may be in a, in a tough fight right now, but the bigger picture, let's just remember what Putin said, not Mike McFaul, what Putin said were his objectives. He said, one, we need to unite all these Slavic peoples because Ukrainians are just you know, Russians with accents. He failed to achieve that objective. Nobody has done more to unite the Ukrainian identity than Vladimir Putin. He's fantastically failed at that. Two, he claimed he was going to wipe out, in his words, not mine, the neo-Nazi regime governing in Ukraine. Uh, in my words, that's the democratically elected Jewish president of Ukraine. That's President Zelensky, who won in a landslide in 2019, by the way, even in those Russian speaking uh, 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 regions of Russia, which by the way, he's from, his native tongue is Russian. Uh, when he visited here two years ago, 
when we hosted him uh, on my tour of Stanford, we spoke Russian together, but he's completely failed at that, right? Mr. Zelensky is still in power, supported massively. Uh, as we all know, he said famously, uh, we wanted him to leave because we didn't want him to be assassinated. And there are reports today, by the way, that there may have been another assassination attempt just recently. I think there were multiple, uh, but he chose to stay uh, rather than listening to the advice of others and go to Poland uh, when he very famously said, I, you know, I don't need ride, I need ammunition. Putin's failed dramatically at that. I won't go through the whole list, but he, he, he failed at the Battle of Kiev. Remember that, right, folks? <laughs> they were, we thought they were going to be in downtown Kiev uh, in two weeks. Fail. Failed the Battle of Kharkiv. 50% of territory taken has now been liberated by the Ukrainian forces. And oh, by the way, he claimed allegedly that he was invading to stop uh, NATO expansion. Uh, we are on the way. Uh, we've already brought in Sweden. We will soon bring in Finland. Uh, the exact opposite. I, I say all that because now we're in a, a harder fight, right? Um, and and but, but I think we need to put it in context. Um, I would say two things about the counteroffensive. One, it's going slower maybe this is obvious, but I think it's important for people to remember. Uh, the counteroffensive last fall uh, went a lot faster uh, in both around Kharkiv, but even in Kherson, but especially Kharkiv, uh, because the Russians weren't dug in. Today, the Russians were dug in. And I think in retrospect, uh, just another reason to go back to why I've been advocating for more weapons faster, had we given them more offensive capability and from the get-go, maybe the Russians would not have been so dug in. I, I, that's, that's a counterfactual, you know, we'll have to wait for the historians to write it, but that's why it's going slower. They're way more dug in. Uh, and number two, uh, the Ukrainians do not have uh, air, you know, they have no air capacity to speak of. Uh, you know, imagine an American general going to war without the Air Force, uh, without air support. Uh, we don't fight wars that way. The Ukrainians are, are having to do that. Um, and, and I think even by their own assessments, it's gone slower than they had hoped. Um, but I would just say two other things. Uh, one you already alluded to, Larry. Uh, we, at least in the coverage and in the news, we keep talking about the counteroffensive. By the way, we forgot about the first one, the one I was just alluding to. This is the second counteroffensive, not the first one. Um, but tragically, um, I fear there will be many counteroffensives. I don't think this war is going to end one way or the other because of this counteroffensive. And already you hear accounts, uh, if you listen closely to what generals in Kiev are saying and, and the government, uh, they're already thinking about the next counteroffensive when they might have counter uh, F-16s, when they might have attackums, when they most surely will have Abrams tanks, right? Those haven't arrived yet. Those will show up in the fall. So I think that's already the way they're thinking. And then the last thing I'll say, I'm not a general, so I don't want to pretend to be one on this Zoom call. And most certainly I try to avoid that on um, television. But I have a lot of friends who are generals, retired generals. Um, and if they were here, uh, they would say, you know, don't pretend we, we know all of the plans of the Ukrainians uh, just yet. Uh, there's a lot of firepower that they haven't used yet. Um, and we should not in any way uh, second guess them and what they're doing. Uh, we should let them fight the war the way they think is the right way to fight the war. And, and, and I agree with that analysis. So it could just be a few months before they start getting, you mentioned the fall, um, some of the more modern and potent weapons that could begin to uh, turn the corner. Uh, now, let me put in reverse the question I asked you about Russia. What is Ukraine's ability to sustain a long conflict? And uh, related to that, how does that intersect uh, with Putin's calculation and obvious aspiration that the tide may turn in his favor uh, after the November 2024 presidential election in the United States? 
honestly, Larry, I don't know. And I don't trust anybody who answers that question uh, as if they do know. Uh, either that Ukrainians are going to break through and, you know, capture Crimea before Christmas, or that the Russians are, are going to launch their counteroffensive. And because they have a larger population and a larger army, they're going to win. I just, I honestly don't know. And, and so I'm going to, I'm going to speculate, but I really honestly don't know. And I think we should be humble uh, in, in assuming that we, we know how wars end, you know, just a year and a half in. If you think about other wars, uh, World War II is on my mind for, for uh, reasons of just work I'm doing on my book right now. Uh, just think about what people were saying uh, at this point in the war. Uh, and then there were turnarounds and then things go fast. And so we don't know. That's the first thing I want to say. Second, what I, my sense, you know, I talk to people in, in uh, Ukraine almost every day. I read opinion polls. Uh, I, I interact with people in the government as well as civil society. My sense in terms of public opinion is that there's a lot of support for continuing to fight and almost zero support for any kind of scenarios that you see oftentimes speculating here in the United States about, well, give them Crimea, give them Zaporizhia and, you know, settle it. I see no support for that. And I think we in the United States, and I don't presume everybody on this call is from the United States, but, but I think we need to appreciate that fact. And we need to appreciate that Ukraine today is a democracy. Uh, so even if Zelensky, you know, in some analysis, sat with his national security team and said, this is our best option, uh, they would have to convince the Ukrainian people of it. Uh, I, and, and, and he's fully aware that he is the democratically elected leader of, of Ukraine, not the autocratic leader that Mr. Putin is. And that is a real constraint for him that I don't think we uh, fully appreciate uh, uh, as outsiders. Third, uh, just because you have the will to fight doesn't mean you have the means to fight. And, and over time, uh, you know, they're, they're going to face limitations in terms of their fighting forces. Uh, they don't publicize the, their losses, but my sense is their losses are pretty, uh, those are big numbers. Uh, and, and that's hard to continue with the kinds of casualties that they have uh, to sustain that for years and years, that's going to be hard. And, and Russia does have a three to one advantage in terms of population. Um, but on the, on the other side, you can see, the, I'm, just, I'm just doing the ledger here because I really don't know. On the other side, I would just say two things they have going for them over the long haul that Putin doesn't have. Uh, one is the will to fight. Uh, Russian soldiers don't know why they're there. Uh, Ukrainians know why they're fighting. Uh, and that's a huge advantage that the Ukrainians have. And second, over time, uh, Russia, uh, Russia is fighting with the best weapons that they have right now. Uh, it's not like they have a bunch of stuff that they're hiding in the tank and, you know, they're just waiting to escalate because, you know, if, if Zelensky bombs the Kremlin or something like that. No, they're all in with what they have now. The Ukrainian army is not in that situation. The Ukrainian army is going, you know, in real time, in a war fighting time. You know, they should have done this 20 years ago and we should have done it with them. But they are transferring from Soviet era platforms to NATO platforms. And, and that is going to have a transformative impact on their fighting forces. Um, as, as, as one military official in Ukraine said to me, you know, one should not compare uh, a MiG-29 with an F-16, let alone an F-35, uh, right? So uh, over time, when that transformation happens, and we are all in, in terms of providing those weapons, and, and I'm going to get to Mr. Trump in the election, although Larry, you're more expert on American electoral politics than I am, you should answer that question. But over time, I think that part uh, becomes a big advantage uh, for Ukraine. Um, and let me tell you, you know, that, that vividly, if you ever get the chance, um, 
there, uh, Zelensky, because he's a comedian, uh, told this in a joke one time uh, when David Letterman was uh, there. They were in the bunker or they were in the metro and Mr. Zelensky, uh, President Zelensky is telling this joke and I'm just paraphrasing now. So please, these are my approximation of his words. Uh, but he's talking about two elderly Jewish men in Odessa talking about the war. Um, and Putin's talking about the war with NATO and one the one uh, grandfather, I think he says, well, how are the Russians doing? And he goes through all their casualties. Uh, and then the, his interlocutor says, well, how is NATO doing? And uh, the old elderly Jewish person says, oh, well, they haven't showed up yet. Uh, and the point is that when we truly show up, not with boots on the ground, you know, President Biden has made that clear. We're not doing that. And I 100 uh, percent uh, agree with him about where to draw that line. But when NATO really shows up uh, with the full uh, arsenal that we can have, that I think will be a major, major uh, advantage for the Ukrainians. There's another way that NATO can show up. Uh, you and I were both part of this debate in advance of the Ju July 11th NATO summit in Vilnius. And that is to do what I sense most Ukrainians were united in wanting to see happen what many American and European uh, policy thinkers wanted to see happen. And that is for NATO to provide Ukraine with a definite timetable for admission to NATO. That didn't happen uh, in Vilnius. Did we miss an opportunity? Could it make a difference? Uh, yes and no. So, uh... I wanted the alliance to do more in Vilnius. I published that. I said that. Um, I thought they should have provided an invitation for membership. But I'm going to get to the distinction in a minute. Um, uh, you know, so I thought that was a missed opportunity. Um, you know, really, since the Bucharest summit in 2008, despite the Putin propaganda and despite even some, you know, analysts here in the United States saying it was the threat of NATO expansion that that drove that compelled Putin to invade the honest truth when people are speaking honestly and I I spoke I spoke honestly about this with Vladimir Putin when I was in the government uh as well as President Zelensky as well as the Biden administration and before there had been zero progress in Ukraine's membership towards uh, uh NATO really since the Bucharest summit and the Bucharest summit was a real mixed message. It was a real mess. On the one hand, they, we said they should get in. On the other hand, they said we should have a membership action plan. And that had to do with deep disagreements between President Bush and other allies. So we had this mixed message. And then, I mean, I was in the government for five years after that. Nothing really happened, uh, despite all the rhetoric that we uh, wanted that their aspirations. And it was my view that after this horrible barbaric invasion of Ukraine, that Vilnius had to be something beyond uh, the Bucharest summit. I think it marginally was, uh, but not enough. Um, my own personal view is in the historic, I think it's the 75th anniversary of NATO. Am I doing the math right? It will be. Um, uh, it'll be held in Washington next summer. Uh, that has to be, for me, the moment when the alliance extends an invitation to Ukraine, but not membership. And here's why I think that's the right approach. Membership implies an attack on one is an attack on all. That's Article 5. And there are some very creative friends of mine, Larry, they're probably friends of yours too, uh, former government officials, who have thought about creative ways where the Article 5 guarantee could be extended to parts of Ukraine that are liberated, but not to those that are fighting today or are occupied. Um, and I think, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but I, I can I can understand the argument. Uh, politically, however, I can't understand the argument because I don't think the American people will support that kind of ambiguous commitment to Ukraine. Uh, where are we? Are we supporting them or not? 
Uh, and I just think it's a hard argument to make. I've tried it with some of my family friends. It takes you 20 minutes to explain. Um, and in a presidential election moment, uh, I'm not the expert on elections, uh, uh, but it, it just I will find it hard to believe that President Biden will want to be spending 20 minutes debating that, uh, especially if he's on the debate, um, you know, if he's debating Mr. Trump, who has a very, very different view about Ukraine's membership in NATO. And frankly, uh, NATO is an alliance, right? So I just think that's maybe it's theoretically, legalistically possible, but I don't think it's practically, politically possible. That's why I like invitation, uh, because invitation is not uh, a commitment to membership, but every country that's been given an invitation eventually has become a member. And I think that just locks in a path dependency uh, that I think symbolically would be important both for the Ukrainians, but I think also for Vladimir Putin, so that he understands that, that this is eventually going to happen. And actually, I think that could help create better conditions for a peace settlement uh, when we get to that moment. Okay, now we've got about, uh, well, what, 13 minutes. Uh, we're into kind of the lightning rounds. So quick questions, quick answers. And I see you have 99 plus Q&A questions there too. So oh, we're not, probably you, not gonna get to you, all of them. You have actually answered many of the questions that were asked. Um, okay, that's but, good, glad uh, to hear that. We can probe a bit more uh, on some of them. First of all, um, Warren asks, you know, what's the balance now of public support for uh, this war in the United States? How do you assess uh, different uh, elements of political support for, uh, con for continuing U.S. support for Ukraine? And then many people have asked, what do you think is going to happen to Ukraine and American engagement with and for Ukraine if Donald Trump becomes president of the United States again? Well, on public support, Larry, you probably know the data better than I do. Um, you know, there are different opinion polls show different things because they're asking different questions. Um, uh, public opinion goes up, by the way, when Ukraine is doing well on the battlefield and goes down in periods of more stalemate. Uh, that's a trend we've seen. Um, and obviously, it's divided between uh, Democrats and Republicans. Uh, Re Republicans uh, much softer support uh, than Democrats. That's the public, but it's still majorities, but 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 creeping down. Um, another indication I should have brought it. I'll I'll put it up on Twitter for those who want to find it. Uh, at McFall, you can follow me, and I'll I'll put it up right after the call. Um, I think it was illustrative that there was an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act, um, and you can see the votes there, right and there was a sizable group of House of Representatives, all, all I think all Republicans that voted against that, um, or, or I should put it the other way, that voted for it because it was a, an amendment to stop assistance. And I want to say 13 senators on the Senate side, but majorities voted against that amendment. That's, that's good news. Um, but I, I worry that if, as the war drags on, uh, all those numbers will soften. Um, and then second, to the point about Mr. Trump, I also worry that uh, as the campaign uh, 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 becomes more active, um, Mr. Trump's views on Ukraine and the war are very clear. Um, and as he begins to make these arguments that we should cut assistance and, you know, we don't have a dog in that fight and I could end this war in 24 hours. You know, I could just call Putin and and the war. Uh, uh, that the support within the Republican Party is going to soften uh, for continued support. It may increase in the Democratic Party. By the way, if Mr. Trump is against it, that could increase support within the Democratic Party. And and Mr. Biden, President Biden's not facing uh, a, a, a serious challenger. Well, uh, you tell me if Mr. Kennedy is a serious one or not, Larry, uh, but uh, 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 but he's not in the battle. There are most certainly more isolationist tendencies within the Democratic Party and voices against more support, but they're not running for president. 
Uh, and that's, I think, that's that dynamic in the run-up to the election. Um, to the question about what happens if Mr. Trump is reelected, um, you know, there, I'm sure there should be another session about the future of American democracy where I get to be the moderator and Larry Diamond speaks about that uh, in that scenario. We don't have time for that tonight, but I would just say a, a couple of things, one negative, one positive. The negative is that in the first Trump administration, he had a lot of views on foreign policy that were unorthodox, as we now know, but he had a lot of people around him that were more orthodox, uh, that were the guardrails, right? You know, Secretary Mattis, uh, General McMaster, two of our colleagues at the Hoover Institution, and many, many others, right? Um, the bad news, from my point of view, is that none of those kind of people will be serving in a second Trump administration, because he he will now believe that he is a mandate for what he wants, uh, and all these people, and he's already said many disparaging things about, you know, he used to love his generals, right? He used to talk about my generals. He doesn't say very kind things about all his generals from before, uh, and therefore, uh, those kinds of people will not be in his administration. That's the bad news. The good news is that we don't live in a dictatorship. We don't live in a monarchy. Uh, and therefore, yes, the president has a lot of power when it comes to foreign policy, but he's not a dictator. And therefore, uh, the idea that we're just going to shut down assistance and we're going to you know, blow up NATO and we're going to abandon Ukrainians, uh, I, for one, will be out there advocating against that. Uh, and we have independent media and think tanks and members of Congress that that provide some way that that won't happen just automatically. Um, and the last thing I'll say, um, you know, and now I'm really getting out on my optimistic uh, ski here, Larry. Um, I've, I've I've written books about uh, how um, in different periods where presidents say. Presidential candidates say things uh, when they're running for office, and they don't necessarily do all those things that they say. Um, and this goes with Democrats and Republicans, by the way. Um, and so, you know, I, I want to be, you know, maybe I am really pulling at straws here, but um, I, I do think they're, you know, the butcher of Baghdad, uh, you, know, I, uh, you know, there's all these things that were said in the heat of the campaign that when you get to the Oval Office, uh, there are strengths, constraints, and even with Mr. Trump uh, and, and his new team, uh, I don't think it'll be just automatic. But I do, I do worry about that scenario. And, and there's, believe me, uh, people in Kiev are, are deeply worried about that scenario as well. Well, uh, since time is getting short, I'll just say five words about that prospect of a second Trump administration. Uh, and this is to our um, very substantial uh, listening audience, be afraid, be very afraid. Um, so uh, Herman asks, uh, since it's so obvious that Putin really will desperately want to see Trump's reelection uh, in large measure because he thinks it will lead to a cessation of, that is Putin thinks, of American support for Ukraine, we can expect that Putin will do everything he can imagine to uh, intervene in the 2024 presidential election. Do you have any thoughts about what the United States can do to prepare for that, deter that, expose that, and do a better job of rebuffing that than was done in 2016? Well, there's some good news and bad news. The good news is after 2016, uh, when we fully understood what happened uh, in many different dimensions and the Mueller report, the Senate investigated uh, intelligence committee report, thousand pages long uh, reports that were done here at Stanford, Larry, that you know about uh, and elsewhere. Um, some, some things did change and particularly on the social media platforms, uh, there were there were lots of new changes put in place uh, to think more systematically and, and to prevent this from happening in the last election cycle. Um, and 
you know, I, I we don't have time to go into details, but we learned from 2016 and we did better in 2020. Uh, the bad news is now there's been a reaction to some of the things that were done in 2020 um, and that that there was overreaction and that there was, you know, there's a there's a committee. Uh, Congressman Jim Jordan is the chair of it that is alleging, I'm not an expert on these things, but he's alleging that there was coordination between the US government and the social media platforms that, that uh, uh, ended up in censorship uh, and first amendment rights of American citizens. I, I don't think that happened. I'm not, I wanna emphasize, I'm not an expert. I don't wanna talk about things that I'm not an expert about. Uh, but as a result of that happening, there's less enthusiasm for vigilance about disinformation uh, among academics, at the platform companies, uh, and of course at, at Twitter, uh, you know, they have new ownership there uh, and, and they may have a different view of this. So, uh, you know, I think the good news is we're, we're in a better, we, we learned from 2016 and did some new things. The bad thing is that we're in the action reaction cycle now. And this is a broader thing, Larry, that, that you're more expert than I am, but, you know, um, it's getting hard for Americans to agree on basic facts. This two plus two equal four. And suddenly that becomes controversial. Uh, and those that, that don't believe in facts, uh, they can play in these spaces. And believe me, I have, you know, the scars and the, uh, of dealing with Mr. Putin and his propagandists. They, they are not constrained by facts whatsoever. Um, and they're, by the way, they're also not trying to win the argument. They just want to they want to make sure that there are no facts and that it's all relative and it's all whataboutism. Uh, and that's scary to me, especially in an era of artificial intelligence, especially in an era where, you know, they can do things now that they couldn't do back in 2016. Just one anecdote on that. Uh, I think I uh, I may have been part of the first, um, you know, militarization of artificial intelligence in that. Uh, an image of me was created by a Russian outfit that then got on calls. Uh, and it wasn't just an image of me. It was a computer uh, generated uh, McFall that could speak Russian and, and gesture just like we're doing on a Zoom call uh, and got on Zoom calls with members of the Ukrainian government. And it was so well done that it was convincing to them that it was me. Uh, and from one of those calls, they made public information that had been private about a, a Ukrainian military operation. That is coming in 2024, as you know well, Larry, uh, and how we oh, deep, deal deep with it. Deep fakes. Deep fakes, yeah. Uh, and it was really weird to see me talking with my accented Russian to the chief of staff of President Zelensky. Uh, and it's only going to get better. And that that's, that's going to be part uh, of the election, too. We have just one minute left, so I have to ask you to be concise, but um, uh, you know President Zelensky, you know the people, many of the people in his administration, you know Alexei Navalny and his family, you know many of the players in opposition in Russia and in defense of democracy in Ukraine. Is there anything you want to say on a personal level as we conclude? Uh, I want to end on an optimistic note in that in the long run, I'm very optimistic about Ukraine. Uh, this tragic moment has created a new national identity and mobilized people in ways that I've been studying and writing about Ukraine since the early 90s. Uh, they will become uh, and we need to help them become a thriving democracy, a thriving market economy uh, with security. And on the other side of the Iron Curtain, Russia, Belarus will be failing uh, uh, dictatorships. And on the long run, Ukraine has to become in this new moment, the West Germany of our new Cold War with Russia. And in doing so, they will inspire people on the other side. And there will be a day like there was in 1989, where people in Russia and Belarus living under tyranny will want to be like the Ukrainians. And Navalny believes that sitting in jail. Uh, Volodya Karamurza, our friend uh, Larry, believes that. And so I think our imperative 
In fact, I'll just end on one of my other friends, uh, what he used to say to me all the time before he was assassinated. His name was Boris Nemtsov. He was, he was assassinated in 2015. Before he was killed, he said to me, Mike, there's little you people in the United States can do inside Russia to help small D Democrats. That the greatest thing you can do is to help Ukrainians succeed in democracy, because if they succeed, they undermine Putin's central argument that Slavic people want dictatorship. And therefore, I, I, I think, A, we got to make it happen, but I'm cautiously optimistic that it will happen. I think tragically from this horrific war will that outcome of a free, thriving democratic Ukraine is in the future. Well, that is uh, a beautiful and inspiring way to end. Uh, I can't help but note the parallel with Taiwan and China as well, but that's for another session. Um, Mike McFall, uh, thank you for educating us and thank you in the end for inspiring us. Thank you to the amazing coalition of organizations and individuals that produce America at a crossroads uh, every Wednesday evening at 5 p.m. Pacific. I do want to note that the next uh, session of this amazing uh, uh, series will be uh, exactly uh, one week from now when uh, David Gergen, uh, an advisor to four former American presidents from Reagan to Clinton, will re reflect on many of the challenges of American democracy today. He will be in dialogue with KCRW's Madeline Brand. Uh, please uh, consider uh, supporting this amazing venture uh, with the uh, uh, links in the um, chat box that Janice has kindly inserted. And thank you all so much for joining us.